Alrighty, welcome to the Computational Problem Solving with Rust course presented by Carpenter Tutoring. My name is Adam Carpenter. Uh, in this first chapter, this sort of introductory chapter, we're going to talk about the study of computer science. Um, it's going to be a little bit high level, and then we're going to start taking the things that we hear about in this chapter, and we're going to start actually learning more about them in the future. But uh, the important takeaway for this chapter really is computer science and computer programming are not just for computer scientists, they're for everybody. Uh, everybody can benefit from them. So let's get started. Why computer science? Why should anybody care about computer science, even if you're maybe not a computer scientist or you don't intend on being a computer scientist? Well, uh, this is a quote I'm borrowing from the book here. Computers are more universally applicable than any other commodity in history. And I think that's a really, really strong phrase, right? There isn't any other machine that we have available to us today which is as universally applicable uh, with as many diverse uses as the computer. Uh, it's a reprogrammable machine. It works for you. You can twist it, manipulate it, make it do what you need it to for what you need to get done. Uh, and that's really why they've become so incredibly ubiquitous. Um, computer science, again, not just computer programming. Uh, that is a large aspect of it, but there are all kinds of things that go into computer science. Theory of computation, efficiency, algorithms. I've got a list here of things that you can do with that. I chose to follow a software engineering path. A lot of other folks follow totally different paths. You might not even be interested in any of these paths other than making software, writing programs, solving problems with your computer to do what you need to do. Um, and that's why computer programming is such a great way to explore all of those fields. It kind of ties them all together in a way. Now, when you're looking at solving problems computationally or programming your computer right, to do things, um, you might encounter some difficulties. And again, this course is intended for somebody who's never programmed before or has maybe only heard about programming or seen somebody else do programming. Um, one of the metaphors that the book uses is it's a lot like writing poetry in a foreign language. Uh, you need two things which you probably don't have if you're just starting out. One is fluency. Uh, you need vocab um, or grammar. You actually need both of those things to read and write a language. Uh, for example, if you're going to write French poetry and you've never read or written or spoken or even heard French in your life, you know you're going to need to learn a little bit of French first in order to be able to do that. The other thing that you need is ability. Uh, rhyming, writing in verse, creativity. Those are things that you need to actually make poetry happen. You might learn the fluency and be able to communicate in French, but you might not be able to write French poetry even if you're totally fluent in French and you know it really well. Um, that takes skill and practice. And learning to program has similar roadblocks, road excuse me. Uh, so fluency kind of sort of translates into syntax and semantics. Uh, that's the structure of your programming language. That's how you actually write code in a programming language, in our case, Rust. Uh, you also need problem solving ability. And that's kind of where this course comes in. It's not just about how to write Rust, but it's about building the skills that you need to transform your problems into solutions to actually take the code syntax that you will hopefully learn to understand and apply it to your particular problem so that you can do something with it. Good programs or essays. This is, everybody has a slightly different definition of what programming is, um, but really programming is writing your solution to a problem. It's translating how you think a problem should be solved, your solution, into an essay. Um, it's your thoughts on not paper, but the screen and inside of the memory of the computer. Uh, and so we're going to start putting these little blue rules in here. Um, these are things that are going to help you write good programs. So how do you achieve that, right? Well, if a program is how you think something should happen, the first thing you need to do is think. I've seen a lot of folks start programming a solution by immediately ripping open some text editor, 
picking a language, finding fun tools to use, and they just start writing code. They don't even necessarily know where they're going yet. They just start doing things. Um, and a lot of times they encounter difficulty because then they have to go back and undo or redo things. But writing a program should describe your thoughts well. You need to think first. The other thing is your essay, your solution, your program isn't just for your computer or any computer. It's actually for other human beings. And it's for you. You're going to read your program over and over and over again. Uh, probably if you pursue it as a career or if you do workshopping inside of your, your um, degree curriculum, you're going to write programs for others or write programs in a group. Those people are going to need to read your code and maybe even change it, write additional code to go with it. Uh, so programs aren't just essays, they're human readable essays on problem solving. They just also happen to run on a computer. Uh, and that's an important distinction to make. You're going to learn later that the languages that we use to write computer programs, they're not the language that the computer necessarily thinks or operates with. They're not the underlying architecture architecture that does the thinking inside of a computer. So these languages are really for our benefit as humans. They make it easier for us to understand what the computer is going to do and make sure that it's going to do what we tell it to. So think about these two rules while you're starting to program, right? Think before you program and keep in the back of your head at all times, your program is a human readable essay on solving problems. It also happens to run on a computer. There is a lot of benefit to problem solving with a computer, right? Your program, your essay on problem solving, because it can be run on a computer is what makes it unique, right? If you just doodled it on a piece of paper, it wouldn't be as special. Uh, it wouldn't be as fundamentally incredible. Um, it has that impact because it can be executed by a computer. So the promise of programming is that your thoughts on problem solving, your program, are executable, they're repeatable, and they're independent of you. So they're executable, meaning they can be run on a computer, of course. They do something. They're repeatable. You know that your instructions are going to be followed exactly every single time you run them. And then finally, they're independent of you. They can be shared. They can be distributed. Your essay on problem solving can be executed and repeated across the globe on all kinds of computers. That's fantastic. Uh, and I have this analogy in here comparing computer programming as sort of the next leap from the printing press, right? The printing press, when it was invented, meant you could take a single copy of a written work, whether it's a novel uh, or it's a Bible or it's scientific nonfiction or something along those lines, and you can carbon copy it. You can turn it into a bunch of books that are all exactly the same format. They all read exactly the same way. The typeface looks exactly the same, and you can distribute them. And all across the world, if everybody's reading the same version, Everybody knows the same thing as what you wrote originally. Programming is like that, but it has the additional benefit of being runnable on a computer. So these are some promises that you get from programming, and it's really what makes programming so special and unique. Now, I already talked about how some people leap first into choosing a language, and now it feels like we're going to immediately do the same thing. Not necessarily. You can pick a variety of languages or pick from a variety of languages to do what you want to do. Every language on the planet was designed with a specific intended purpose. And really what you're doing, the kinds of problems you're trying to solve, are what determines which language you're going to use. Now, the whole point of me making this course was to use Rust. Um, and I have a couple of reasons for that, why I like to choose Rust. This tagline up here, this is actually from, uh, I believe, the Rust language website where you can download and install Rust. Uh, its tagline is performance, reliability, and productivity. That's sort of the triad of reasons to use Rust. Now, those kinds of things may not seem that important or make a whole lot of sense at this point, but 
I have some bullet points here for why I think it's beneficial. There are a lot of useful types and memory guarantees that Rust makes. Now that's not important to you now, but it's gonna become very important to you later because you're going to see how Rust works for you, how it makes your life easier. Uh, it makes it very easy to write concurrent programs. Concurrent programming is something that's going to become even more important as we progress into this century. Um, and that is programs that do multiple things at the same time. We have all kinds of software now operating systems, networking stacks, things which are doing multiple operations simultaneously. Even the architecture of most modern computers supports this. So it's going to be very important moving forward that as programmers, we take the time to learn how to write concurrent programs. Um, as hardware starts to maybe not grow as fast as quickly as we had previously expected, we might need to learn how to make our software go faster instead of making our hardware go faster. And we'll get into that a little more later. One of the top reasons for using Rust, it has an incredibly friendly compiler and a borrow checker, which is very helpful. You don't know the borrow checker yet, maybe you've heard of it, but you're going to learn why it's a benefit and why the compiler is so nice to use and why some other languages may choose not to do things that way. There's good documentation, that's another beneficial reason of using Rust, and it offers good standard libraries and the third-party libraries that are easy to access. That helps you get started. Having the third-party libraries means that you can use the code that other people have written in your code, in your programs and problem solving to make your job easier. You don't have to do as many things from scratch. And luckily, when we talk about you know things like types, things that we haven't really discussed yet, the constructs surrounding types are something that everybody really understands thanks to being in middle school and learning mathematics at some point during you know their grade school curriculum. Everybody kind of knows what variables and functions and types are. Um, you know when you're doing chemistry equations or even you know uh, geometry, right? Inches are different from centimeters. They both have numbers in front of them, right? But those units indicate a different type of value. Um, that's, that's kind of analogous to a language like Rust where you have lots of different types to do lots of different things with. And we'll talk about some of those types later. And of course, variables and functions. Uh, if you've done any kind of algebra before uh, in your schooling, you probably understand, you know, Assume x is equal to this, uh, and then determine the result of x given a function, something along those lines. So you already have pretty much everything you need to understand the programming language, including a language like Rust. And I have a little caveat in here. Some people have heard of other languages, which maybe they're interested in learning. Uh, I'm hoping that by choosing this course, you are kind of interested in uh, choosing Rust as your first language or learning Rust intentionally, but why not some of these other popular languages, the C programming language or Java or Python, languages that you may see other folks learning or using. Uh, some of these languages have drawbacks, I think, for beginners. Uh, they might force you to think about computer organization. Uh, for example, the C programming language, very manual memory management. You kind of want to know how the processor works, how the cache works, how memory is organized and laid out. That might not be something that you're ready to tackle. You might only be interested in, again, solving problems with your computer. Um, other languages may kind of force you into a single paradigm. Rust is considered a multi-paradigm language. What does that mean? It really only means that you can program in a variety of styles. Some of these languages have very consistent styling and they kind of direct you towards one of them. So learning that language also means learning that style. Uh, with Rust, I don't think that that's as much of an issue. That's probably debatable for some folks watching this if they're experts. And then finally, some languages like Python promote dynamic type conversions, or they make it easy to dereference null values. Now, we haven't talked about that yet, of course. Maybe you already know what that means, but these are pitfalls. These are things that actually make it a little more difficult to learn. Um, understanding how you could convert without even asking the computer's permission something 
from one type to another could be catastrophic when you're beginning to program. It could result in undefined output, things that you don't want or understand. And dereferencing null values, there's kind of a joke in the industry based on previous understanding that that's a billion dollar mistake. Uh, dereferencing null values can lead to your computer crashing and it can lead to uh, dumping memory. Uh, it can just make your life as a programmer beginning more difficult. So Rust is a language that prevents that kind of thing from happening. It helps prevent you from making mistakes. Regardless of your skill level, you know if your Rust program compiles, you're not going to dereference a null value. You're not going to convert from one type to another accidentally. And that's why I think it's a good language for beginners. If you disagree, you might want to check out another course. <laughs> this one isn't going to be for you. Of course, there's a caveat to that, and I kind of talked about this already. But if you don't know it, there's no best language. Everybody likes the word best, and I don't know why. There isn't a best language. They all have compromises. Every language has strengths. Every language has weaknesses. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. <laughs> it's just the way that it is. Uh, but what Rust is, is a good, stable, general purpose language. And when I say general purpose, I mean it has broad applications. You can use it for lots of different things, not just a few individual specific things. And I think that's beneficial because then you can kind of take it in the direction you want to. Once you get started programming, hopefully you like this course and get to the end of it, you'll be equipped to go and explore other languages. You'll know the constructs that are the bare building blocks of pretty much every language that we have today. Uh, and then you can go and figure out, oh, well, this language over here, this solves my problem better, or this makes my life easier, or, you know, I really want a language that helps me do things on the web. Maybe I should go and try this one. There's all kinds of things out there. You'll have the freedom to explore on your own, but hopefully you'll have the knowledge that you need to understand how to, again, program, solve problems. The language is going to be secondary to that. It's just an implementation detail. So let's talk a little bit about computation. We've kind of referenced that word a lot so far. What is computation? Well, there's kind of this very generic definition that I think the book gave. It is the manipulation of data by humans or machines, whether that's numbers, letters, other symbols, whatever your data is, the manipulation of data. That's the most bare bones definition of computation. And it sounds very, very generic. And that's kind of because it is. And a computer is just something that does computation. Uh, it doesn't really specify how that computation is done. Um, and that's kind of up to you, right? You're going to be the one telling a computer how it's going to manipulate data, how it's going to do computa computation to solve a problem. But every computer needs things to do that, and every language is going to need things to help that along. Uh, that is accepting data as input, right? Doing computation on that input, manipulating that data, you kind of get to decide how that happens, and then outputting that data. And this goes back to mathematical functions as you kind of learn them in algebra or geometry. Um, they all kind of accept some input, they perform some function or equation or manipulate those numbers, crunch them, and then you get some output at the end. And that's fundamental to every computer, be it human or machine. Why am I saying human computers? What is that? Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. But our modern computer has all kinds of components to support these functions, to do data manipulation, to take input, to take output. Um, right now, I'm using a keyboard. That is input. That is a way that the computer knows what to do next because I'm telling it to. Um, I also have output, right? Uh, I have a screen in front of me that I'm looking at. I have speakers that make sound and noise. Uh, but there are lots of other things that we don't really think about, right? Computers get a lot of their input and output done over a network. Talking to other computers allows for communication between entire groups of computers across the world. Um, that is just an input and output device. Um, my webcam that I'm looking at right now is another input device. This, these are all components that help drive a typical home computer today, that help it accept input, provide output, 
manipulate data inside of memory, for example, where all of these things are kind of tied together and the processor can act on them. Now we talked a little bit about human computers. What is a human computer? Well, computer used to be a job description for human beings. Before we had electronic computers or even mechanical computers, we had people computers. Um, our general purpose reprogrammable electronic computers first appeared in the 20th century. And I think the name just kind of stuck because it did more or less the work that human computers were doing. Now, this is going super deep into how computers operate. And it sounds like we've already veered off from, I just want to learn Rust and how to program. But this is going to be crucial to understanding why your language is going to work the way it works, why the computer is going to do things that you might not understand. Every single digital computer, all of them, the basis is the on-off switch, like a light switch, like I have on the wall back there, right? You flick it on, you flick it off. The technology behind that concept has evolved with all kinds of different iterations, right? We started with mechanical switches called relays. Um, we moved on a little bit to vacuum tubes, which you may have seen in an old tiny radio that you picked up at a yard sale or something like that. Eventually, we made our way to tra transistors. Transistors are little electronic switches, and there are billions of them in this room right now, probably trillions in this room because I've got all kinds of computers around here. But they're little teeny tiny switches that we bake into things like memory and processors and other electronics. They are used to power other switches. Basically what you're doing with transistors is you're creating circuits, just like you have in your house, just like you would have in maybe one of those little snap circuit boards that you played with as a kid. Circuits are used to represent logic. That's how we can make a digital computer appear to be thinking. That's how it can do calculations. Here's an example, if that seemed really weird and all of the talk about transistors didn't make a lot of sense. Go back to the light switches. This is the easiest analogy I know of to go back to to understand it. Think about a three-pole light switch in your house. A three-pole light switch is that one switch uh, that has a brother or sister switch somewhere else. You flip one of the switches and the light turns on. But you can also walk across the room or into the hallway and flick a switch and the same light will turn off, right? Think about how that works. You have that switch in the hallway, you have some switch in your living room, and then you have the same light attached to them. Both of those switches are connected to that lamp, but they're also connected to each other. Neither of those switches can be in the same place at the same time. If you flip one of them on and the other off, you're not going to get a light, right? But if you flip both of them on or both of them off, um, or if your switches are wired a little bit differently, they just have to be in a different state from each other, so one is off and one is on, you will end up getting a lamp lit. All this is really doing is creating a circuit with two inputs, two switches. And this is the foundational building blocks of logic, right? That result, that lamp being on or off, is being determined by your input. And the astute among you who already know a little bit about logic programming or Boolean algebra is the big fancy curriculum term for it. This is an X nor gate. <laughs> That's the really weird collection of letters there. We'll talk more about logical operators later and what they mean. Uh, but all you really need to know now is this is how circuits are built. This is how logic happens, right? I have these inputs, I can switch these switches, and I can make other changes happen elsewhere. And I can create logic with that. And I can build that logic into more and more complex ways of solving a problem. All you have to do to translate that analogy into a computer is take your light switches and replace the, the presence of current flowing through the wires in your wall into truth. If your switch is off, you have false. You have nothing, you have zero, you have no. If your switch is on, you have true, or the number one, 
positive, yes. Every digital computer works this way, all of them, uh, until you start getting into quantum computing, I guess, but we're not gonna talk about that in this course. <laughs> That's out of scope for us. Um, so if you go back to our example here, you replace on with true. Um, if two trues make a true and a true and a false make a false, you can start to think about how you might combine operators and truthy values and falsy values to accomplish logical problem solving. We're going to get into that more later. We're going to have a whole chapter dedicated to it. The important thing is you don't just have on and off. You can represent other things. And that's really where the benefit comes from. Uh, so how do we take all of those little transistors, little zeros and ones of those on-off switches, what state they're in? How do we turn it into paper, uh, paperwork, right? Documents, photos, uh, movies, networking, all of this other cool stuff that we can do with our computer. How do we represent that data? I have math on here, but don't be afraid. I don't like math, <laughs> and I wouldn't put anything on here that I thought was difficult to understand. So bear with me through this slide because it's fundamental stuff. We got to talk about it. So probably before you even got into kindergarten, you learned how to count to 10, right? And if you didn't learn before kindergarten, you probably definitely did it in kindergarten. Um, we have 10 figures as humans. It's really, really convenient for us to use a number system, decimal, which gets its name from the 10 digits in the system. Um, it's just easier for us to count that way. I'm sure if we had eight fingers, we'd probably have an octal, sim uh, an octal system and we would count with that, but decimal. The decimal system is base 10. When we say best 10, we mean we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We have 10 digits to work with. And every time you run out of digits, when you're counting up, you increment the next place up a digit. So the number 735 is 700s, right? Plus 3 10s, plus 5 ones. That's how that number reads in decimal. You could also write it this way. Seven times 10 to the second power, and of course 10 to the second power is 10 times 10, so that's 100. So seven times 100 plus two times 10 to the first power, that's going to be uh, a typo because I was supposed to put three there, but pretend it's a three times 10 to the first, that's 30, plus five times 10 to the zeroth power. Anything to the zeroth power is going to be one. That's how we build a multi-placed number with many digits using the 10 numbers that we have available on our fingers. That's decimal. You've been using it your whole life. Lots of other counting systems exist though, and your mind's about to be blown because you never thought that you could count in anything other than tens. Uh, for example, we have this ridiculous system called sexagesimal or sexagesimal. Uh, that, that uses 60 digits. And you might think, I don't know why I would ever need that. Well, it's actually a really old system. Uh, and we do use it every day. It's the basis of timekeeping. Um, on a clock, you measure seconds from 0 to 60. Uh, and that was eventually translated into measuring angles as well um, in a slightly different system than you might be used to. But timekeeping. Right, 60 digits uh, until you increment, right? If you have 00 colon 00, like I have on this little digital clock down here, 0645, 46 is my seconds place. Think of that as my ones place. It's going to count all the way up from 0 to 59, and then it's going to move over and spill into the next place, the hours place. And that's when I'm going to go 59 back to zero, and then increment my hours place. So that's a 60-digit system, if you will, even though we use the same digits as we do in decimal. Now let's talk about binary. Uh, let's say we have our computer, which has a bunch of little on-off switches inside of it. How many different ways can you put an on-off switch? Well, unless you're really good at getting it to balance right on that little post in the middle, uh, it's on or off. It has two. 
that means we have two digits to work with. So if we want to represent numbers in a computer, which is made up of on-off switches, we have to use a base two system, and that system is called binary. Binary works the same way as decimal. The only difference is you don't have as many numbers to count with. This looks like 101. In binary, that's the number five. Whoa, why, how? Well, start counting from right to left. Instead of using powers of 10, you're going to use powers of two. One times two to the zeroth power. And remember, anything to the zeroth power is one, so one times one is one. Add to that zero times two to the first power. Zero times two is zero. Anything times zero is zero. So you're going to put that in the zero's place, or the two's place, I should say. And then one times two to the second power, one times two squared, or four. So if you add these all together, one times four plus zero times two plus one times one, you're going to get five in decimal. That's how we do arithmetic, actually, and counting and everything else in binary. Where you would start counting at zero and count at one, if you would eventually go to two in a decimal system, you're now going to spill over. Instead of waiting until 10 to spill over into the next place, you're going to spill over at two. So this is your ones place right here. The one next to it, this is actually your twos place, not your tens place. And then this is your fours place, not your hundreds place. So this is five. We're going to do a little more binary math later. You don't need to quite be comfortable with it yet, but it's important to know that this is how numbers look inside of the computer uh, at every level, basically, until they get displayed in some fashion that you can do something useful with. Uh, all of these digits, these binary digits, we call them bits. Uh, it's a little note down here. Every digit in a binary number is a bit. So one is a bit, zero is a bit, one is a bit. Binary digits. Bits is just short for that. So keep that in mind if you see bits written anywhere, because you will. Um, we use bits all the time uh, in computing. Uh, it's just how we do numeric calculations. Now, there are interesting limitations to this. Uh, it's a little tricky to represent the numbers that we're used to in math, for example, using nothing but bits, nothing but binary digits. Um, in math, you have numbers counting upwards and downwards forever, but your computer is incapable of representing that. It only has limited space. So in math, where you may have said, oh, yes, and so and so it goes on forever. Yeah, the computer can kind of sort of represent that, but not very easily at its core. Um, a 32-bit computer, for example, will use 32-bit words or collections of bits to represent its numbers. Um, probably you don't even have a 32-bit computer in your house anymore, but previously that's meant that without some special uh, programming, you couldn't represent a number bigger than 2 to the 32nd power, which is a little over 4 billion. Uh, and that was kind of an issue, you know? It represented in uh, a lot of programming problems and predicaments. Nowadays, you have a lot of 64-bit processors or 64-bit computers. That's 2 to the 64th power. That's an even more drastically huge number. And then, of course, we have fractions. You've used fractions in math a lot, uh, or real numbers, I guess, is what all the mathematics people will want me to call them. But doing fractions or real numbers in binary is kind of tricky. Um, and it's always going to be a struggle. And it kind of goes back to having that whole, and it goes on forever and ever, you know, two divided by three, for example. Two thirds represented as a decimal with tens, hundredths, thousandths, all the way after the decimal point. It just goes on forever. Um, we're always going to have to approximate this when we're programming. And it's something you're going to have to watch out for if you start working with fractions. I have just a little itty bitty Rust program here to look at. All this does is it prints 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 0.2. 1 point 1.1 plus 2.2, excuse me. It just prints out the addition of those two numbers. You and I know what that is. You and I know that that's probably really, really easy. 
uh, it's going to be 3.3. Uh, it's easy because those numbers add together very nicely. There isn't a whole bunch of math going on at the end. Uh, but unfortunately for the computer, even something as basic as that is really tricky. And pretty much every intro to computational problem solving course on the planet likes to demonstrate this. I'm going to run this program right now in front of you, and you're going to see what the result looks like. It's 3.3, but there's something tacked on all the way at the end of there. Why? <laughs> Why does that happen? Um, we could talk more about it later, uh, but essentially the way that computers round and the way that computers do arithmetic, um, this is a limitation. You're always going to get just a little bit of a fudge factor at the end. Uh, computer science people love to talk about, the, and probably mathematics people as well, why that is. All you need to know is it's a thing. Keep an eye out for it. And hopefully we'll get into it later. But it's not quite as easy as simply adding two numbers like you or I would. And that's because of the system that we have to use to do this computation. Now let's talk about the units of measurement. We already talked about bits. I'm going to gloss over this a little bit because it's kind of just vocabulary. A bit is just a zero or a one. It's a binary digit. To make our lives easier when we're talking about numbers made up of bits, we like to chunk them because grouping them together makes it easier to read. Big, long binary numbers, even if they represent very small values, they get large really fast. Having only two numbers to count on kind of sort of results in that. Uh, so a chunk of eight bits is a byte. We standardized on that a while ago, and it just stuck. Um, I don't think there's really another good rhyme or reason for it. Somebody might comment and say, oh, this is why, because so and so and such and such. But bytes are eight bits. Uh, you probably see bytes on all kinds of packaging and posts on the web, uh, eight gigabytes of memory, for example, in your computer, or 64 gigabytes of storage in your phone. Um, a gigabyte is a factor of bytes equating to about a billion. Um, you have megabytes, which are about a million bytes, and kilobytes, which are you know about a thousand bytes. Um, and these are ways that we cluster bits together and bytes together to make it easier to read. This is a lot nicer than the binary representation of that value, I can assure you. Uh, we also have words. Uh, and computer words are made up of bytes. Uh, we talked a little bit about 32-bit computers. A 32-bit word, which a 32-bit computer operates on, is made up of four bytes. Um, four times eight to 32. That's the math on that one, by the way. This is all terminology that we use to describe collections of bytes and bits and words and how the computer is doing processing with those numbers. So just keep them in the back of your head. If you see them again in the future, you can come back here, look it up, or look it up online. Text. We've only talked about numbers so far. Everything you're looking at on this screen, though, pretty much, <laughs> there's a couple numbers on here, but everything is text. Everything is printed words, things like you or I would see inside of a book. Um, we have to map the numbers that a computer works with, because again, it only has on-off switches to work with, and therefore it only has binary numbers to work with. So how do we turn those numbers into letters? Um, we have character mapping. Uh, characters, not like video game or comic characters, they're letters and punctuation and blank characters. Basically, anything that you would see on a keyboard. Um, is going to be a character of some kind. And we use those to write human readable text on a computer, like this slide. I wrote this with my keyboard. You probably already use the computer to do this. If you ever opened Microsoft Office, you have written something with characters, which somewhere deep down inside the computer get mapped into numbers. Now, it's important to remember that we have printable characters, which you're probably used to seeing. Uh, we also have unprintable characters, which you kind of can't see because they're sort of invisible, but they do change what the formatting of your text looks like. You have the new line. Every time you hit the Enter key, you're shooting a new line into whatever text you write. It sort of brings your cursor from the right-hand side at the end of your line 
down to the left hand side of the next line. That's a new line character. Uh, actually, that's two characters in one when you think about it. A new line is going down, a carriage return brings you back. These kind of come from the typewriter days where you had an actual devoted key or a function on the typewriter to carry out these operations. Um, you had a carriage return bar across the top of the typewriter, which would bring your writing back to the left. And then you also had a key which would bring you down to the next line. It would toggle and switch and rotate the um, page so that you could continue typing on the next line. And eventually they got that to where one key did the same thing until you needed to bring the carriage return over or an electric typewriter if you ever got a chance to use one of those. And of course you have tabs, right? You have the tab key on your keyboard. That makes a lot of sense. Maybe you tab over um, and you have tab stops even in something like Microsoft Word uh, where you can create columns of text. And we have these kind of funny looking ways of representing these three things because Again, you can't really see tabs in new lines, right? Like, here's a new line. Um, kind of weird to look at and just know that it's a new line. So we like to put things like backslash n, like, oh, by the way, there's a new line here, or t for tab or r for carriage return. We'll use those when we write programs later. If we want our program to know, hey, I want you to do something with new lines. I want you to create new lines, or I want you to look for new lines. That's going to be really, really important to do text processing because as human beings, we move around on the page a lot. We write right to left or left to right, and then we run out of space, and then we continue. We don't just keep writing out all the way till the end of time. So how do we represent all these printable and unprintable characters? We have some standards for doing that. Uh, we make sets to translate from numbers to characters and back again so that we can represent them in binary. One of the first ones was ASCII, A-S-C-I-I, -I, uh, all the way back in 1963. Basically, there was a number for every letter in the English alphabet and every printable character on the English keyboard, uh, plus some non-printing characters. If you want to see what that looks like, uh, you can run something like this if you have a shell that has the available commands. And you can go and see a page that looks kind of like this. This is the ASCII table, um, and it's available on pretty much every computer today still. Uh, and it has everything that you think you would need to do most writing uh, to create little arithmetic equations, things like that. Um, but this was one of the first character sets. And as you can see, everything has an ID. So uh, the letter A here has the octal 101. Uh, can't remember what that equates to in decimal off the top of my head, but you kind of get the gist. There's an ID mapping to every character. So the computer knows that if it's going to take the letter D, it can store it somewhere as 104. Um, it can put that in memory, write it to disk, do something with it, add it to a bunch of other characters. And then when it comes time to print it out to you again, you don't want to see the number 104. It can convert it with this table to the letter D. That's really beneficial for us. And now today we have Unicode uh, or implementations of Unicode. You might have seen UTF-8 on the web at some point, or you might have uh, looked up a Unicode chart online to have like funny emojis or weird arrow characters or things like that. Um, Unicode is like a newer, better version of ASCII. It has thousands of characters. Remember before we only had like a few rows of characters, but that was for that was okay for maybe Americans or folks who speak English, but we also had things like Korean characters to think about or Latin characters to think about or Greek characters to think about. Um, we need those, we need a place to map those and that's what Unicode does for us. It's also the default for Rust and that's why we talk about it here. It lets us write things like this, right? We've got this funky little um, C in French. I'm um, probably disappointing my French professor right now, but you can see what that looks like when it gets printed. It means something very different from the letter C that we have in English, and we can do that with Unicode. And then the last thing that I want to talk about in this section is representing much more complex data. Uh, we have images, we have sound, we have this video feed that you're looking at right now. Um, if you look closely at the screen in front of you, uh, apart from 
being scolded by your mother that you're going to go blind like I used to. <laughs> you're going to see there's rows and rows and rows of little small squares. Um, and it's kind of funky because when you zoom out all the way and you look at the screen, you don't see the little squares very well. Um, at a distance, they all combine to make up an image. These are called pixels. You've played games or looked at images or heard the word pixels before. That just stands for picture element. This is basically just a way of representing a small piece of color uh, in a specific location. And we can use different color schemes and bigger, smaller screen resolutions and orientations to create and store and make images happen. Um, and we can store those coordinates and colors, of course, with clever mappings and formats uh, as data binary numbers. And that's how we can turn something like a binary number in memory into the picture that you see on your screen. Sound is kind of tricky. Sound in our life, as with everything in, quote, real life outside of the digital computer, uh, it's described as a wave. And a wave is just sort of this free flowing up and down with an infinite variety. And those waves that generate sound, they're just air pressure. Our eardrums register air pressure as sound. All kinds of biology and audio people probably don't like how I'm approximating that. But basically, sound waves are communicated from like mouth to ear. Uh, and the air pressure travels across the atmosphere on the way to its destination. And then it's registered uh, as that wave. We can't perfectly represent things like that wave, just like we can't perfectly represent pixel, pix, pictures, excuse me, with pixels, because if you zoom in, you can see the little squares. We have to approximate. And we have to do the same thing with sound. We have to approximate that wave. So we sample it. Um, I never liked calculus, but one of the cool things in calculus was, of course, finding the area under a curve. That is a way of getting the exact value of the area under a curve, but you might've learned before you did that in calculus how to stack rectangles under a curve to kind of approximate that curve. That's what we're doing with a sound wave on a computer. Uh, we have height or amplitude to represent the wave at given intervals. And how many times we do that in a given interval is the sample size. So we can use a microphone plugged into our computer to take a digital sample, build an approximate wave, and then we can play it back by running the ups and downs of that wave at the same sample rate that it was originally recorded at. We push that through a speaker, the speaker makes the little airwave pulses, and then it reaches our ears and we register roughly the same sound that we heard before. Super simplification, but I'm only talking about this so that you can understand how the computer does things with the information that you and I care about. We care about images, we care about sound, we care about text and math and numbers. This is the data that the computer manipulates when we're solving problems in our programming language. That's why we talk about that. That's why it's important. And we're gonna use all of this data later. We're gonna do cool things with it uh, on our computers. Oh, so that was kind of a mouthful, uh, but super high level digestion of information happening right now. Uh, lots of things to talk about. Obviously, we covered a little bit about the theory of computation, why we study computer science, what computer problem solving is. Uh, we also defined those couple of rules for ourselves, right? Remember that you need to think before you program, and we're going to start programming in the next chapter, finally. Uh, and then your program is human readable, right? It's an essay on your thought, your problem solving. And it can be executed by a computer and it can do all kinds of cool things. Uh, keep that in mind as we talk through the next chapter. So my name is Adam. Thank you so much for watching the first installation of this course on Carpenter Tutoring. We got a lot of cool ground to cover. You're going to learn how to solve problems on the computer. You're going to learn how to do it in a language that um, will, I think, benefit you in the long term. Uh, and it'll help you investigate other languages as well. So thank you for joining me on the first step of your journey, learning how computers work, how to make the computer work for you. Thank you. Have a good one.